Welcome back to educator.com. This is the lesson on hearing. When we look at the ear, we want to start on the outermost portion, sort of the most uh, superficial, most lateral part of the ear. Now, in an anatomy and physiology course, when you say the ear, you're not just talking about this. You're talking about all that stuff on the inside, too. So the outer part of the ear that has that lobe, that typical look that we see on human beings, that's actually called the auricle. Now, the way that I remember that is the term aura, A-U-R-A. Um, you may have heard someone say like, oh, your aura is green. Um, <laughs> aura is something that's kind of emanating from you, uh, projecting from you. And the auricle is emanating or projecting from your skull. The lobes of the ear are the auricles. You can also called, you can call them a pinna or plural be pinnae. You may have heard the term pinnipeds, uh, which relates to uh, sea lions. Um, but, but pinna, um, that actually is another name for the auricle. And it's made of, you know, mostly cartilage and fat. Um, so it's a lot of it's soft bone uh, with skin on top of it. And they are shaped like little satellite dishes. And they typically are kind of angled in a way where you can hear mostly what's on the sides of you and in front of you. Think about it. Our ears are not facing backwards. They're facing sort of to the side and forwards. And if you do this little cupping action on the sides of your head, you're sort of exaggerating um, the, the action of your ears. You know, if something you can't hear very well and you go like that, it's like you're extending that little satellite shape. And if you hear something behind you, you're going to you're going to turn so you can perceive it better uh, through your auricles. If you go into that hole, um, which is primarily formed by that passageway, that metis in the temporal bones that you may have heard about if you watch the skeletal lessons, the external acoustic metis or external auditory metis in, in certain books is uh, that hole that goes inside the temporal bone. And actually this part of the picture here that is a spongy bone of the temporal bone. And then this would be uh, the periosteum on the sides of it the, and, and the compact bone. Uh, but I'm digressing. Uh, this hole that leads into the middle and inner ear, uh, there's going to be skin lining it, of course. And on top of that, you're going to have hair and ceruminous glands. So what is an ear hole without hair? So everybody's got hair on the inside of there. Even if you can't see it, there's hairs in there. That's that's normal. And of course, like with hairs in the nose, uh, they're catching that dust, those particles going in and preventing them from causing an ear infection. Uh, you don't want to lose your hearing over something going inside of there. So the hairs are going to protect that. And yes, excess hairs, uh, some people will trim them. Um, it's funny, as you age, um, those hairs uh, can get more obvious in certain individuals. Uh, the ceruminous glands are a, a kind of gland uh, similar to sebaceous glands, but modified in a sense so that these ceruminous glands are producing something called cerumen. Cerumen. And cerumen is a very waxy substance. That's what, what's causing the buildup of earwax inside your ear canal. And the purpose of that, to make that sticky, waxy stuff, is to once again catch bacteria, uh, catch particles and things coming into that ear canal and into that external auditory metis and preventing it from getting to the eardrum and beyond. Um, that wax accumulates and yeah, there are ways to clean it out. Um, some people produce more than others and there are probably genetic and dietary factors that have to do with that. The tympanic membrane is what separates the external or outer ear from the rest of the stuff on the inside. And the tympanic membrane is better known as the eardrum. It's also called the tympanum. Uh, so it has really three different names. And, and eardrum is a great term because it's kind of like a snare drum in, in terms of uh, how sound waves vibrate it. Uh, so it's a very uh, rigid um, set of membranes with a very thin layer of skin on the uh, external portion of it, on the, the lateral side of it, the one that's facing uh, the external part of your body. Um, when, they, uh, when you go inside of a pool and they say like, oh, I got, I got water inside my ear. Uh, the water isn't actually inside your ear. It's still in the external ear. And if, if you can see this with the blue, when water goes inside of your ear, sometimes it's just resting right here against that eardrum. 
Uh, and so a simple, you know, shaking can get that water out. Uh, but you're not going to get water in here. And, and if you do, um, your chances of infection are, are going to go up. Uh, but yeah, uh, the tympanic membrane, the eardrum, uh, is what it actually vibrates uh, when sound waves come in. So that's, that is the first structure that's actually uh, being impacted by sound waves entering your ear. And that's going to transmit um, those vibrations further in. It's going to amplify them based on what's connected to them, to, to the tympanum, and then uh, further on at the inner ear. So that is the external ear. The middle ear is from the inside of the tympanum or eardrum all the way up to uh, the bony labyrinth, uh, which is made up of the cochlea and these other parts. So all in here is the middle ear. You can call it the tympanic cavity if you want. Uh, the auditory tube is a hollow passageway uh, that's going to connect the middle ear to the nasopharynx. And that's a technical term for the top of the throat. So the pharynx is the throat, and the top of the throat is right next to the nasal conche, the nasal cavity. And it's important that we have this tube there. It's also called uh, the auditory tube or eustachian tube. Uh, anytime that you get that, that change in pressure inside of your head, like maybe you're going up in an airplane, you're going up or down in elevation in a car, and you get that like where it's like you, you feel like there's a buildup of pressure, getting rid of that pressure and equalizing it, you can thank the eustachian tube. Uh, so for instance, let's say you're going really high up in the mountains in a car. The atmospheric pressure is gonna gradually drop. So at sea level, the atmospheric pressure might be like one atmosphere or ATM, but you go up higher and higher and higher, maybe it gets you know, to 0 0.8, 0 0.7, what have you. And as that air pressure drops, the air pressure outside of your eardrum is what's dropping, but the air pressure inside in the middle ear is staying how it was from where you were coming from. So that's creating a, a pressure difference. So the pressure outside of your head is dropping, but the pressure inside of here is now greater than what's outside of your head. So that can actually push on the eardrum and ever so slightly, you know, push it. Um, and, and depending on whether you're dropping uh, an elevation or going up, it's going to push the eardrum one way or another. And that can be very uncomfortable, that, that buildup of pressure. When you open and close the opening to the eustachian tube inside of your upper throat, that's going to allow the pressure to move in and out to equalize it with respect to what's on the outside of your head. So you've probably heard this, you know, chewing gum or are going like that or swallowing uh, is going to open and close the opening of the eustachian tube and equalize the pressure. So you can get rid of that uncomfortable feeling. Um, when we look at what's next, what is actually connected to the eardrum that's going to amplify uh, the reception of those sound waves is three auditory ossicles. An ossicle is a fancy term for bone. Ossification is the formation of bone. So auditory ossicles are your middle ear bones. And there are three ear bones, malleus, incus, and stapes. Those come from Latin terms, but in English, we can say hammer, anvil, and stirrup. Uh, so the hammer is first, that's the one that's directly attached to the inside of the tympanum. Next is the anvil, named after, you know, you see them in cartoons dropping on people's heads. Uh, there's an anvil. And then um, a uh, stapes, or stirrup, looks a lot like what you would put your foot in when you're riding a horse. Um, and it actually looks very, very similar to that. We'll see on the next slide. But these three middle ear bones are really amplifiers. Just like if you plug a guitar into an amp, you're making the sound from the electric guitar a lot louder because of the amp amplification. If you look at reptiles, oftentimes they'll have one middle ear bone connecting their eardrum to the inner ear. We have three as a mammal. And so if you look at uh, the animal kingdom, mammals in general, very good hearing. We're taking little vibrations against this uh, um, eardrum and making them a lot louder. The tympanic muscles are the muscles, uh, there's two main ones, that attach to these middle ear bones. And, and they help keep them in place. And also, one of them actually prevents the stapes from ramming into the cochlea too hard. And this will make more sense uh, in a couple slides. But the cochlea is this snail shell shaped uh, body. It's a hard body that contains these sensitive cells inside of it that are allowing you to hear. 
And the stapes is that middle ear bone that's vibrating against the cochlea. So depending on how the stapes hits it, that gives us the different pitches we hear, high versus low, the loudness we hear, loud sounds versus very faint sounds. And if we hear a really loud, loud decibel noise, the stapes will ram really hard into the cochlea. And so those very loud noises are more likely to damage the cochlea. Well, one of those muscles will actually tense up and prevent the stapes from hitting it too hard. And that's a nice adaptation to have. Um, quick side note. I saw this amazing documentary about um, the Inuit peoples, also known as Eskimos to some, uh, the Inuit peoples up north, they live in an area that, that typically you don't hear as much of the noise as you would in a city or even suburbia. It's very quiet, um, very few noises in the environment. You're occasionally going to hear like, you know, glaciers moving and, and, and glacier ice falling into the ocean. But on a daily basis, they're not hearing uh, traffic, construction, uh, etc. Well, a lot of those people will still go out and hunt for seals. And they'll go and they'll use rifles. And the rifle will be right next to their head. And they start hunting from a very young age, from adolescence. And the amazing thing is that just hearing the rifle noise, you know, weekly, uh, daily, that loud bang... They're not used to having that tensor muscle pull on the stapes and, and prevent it from ramming into the cochlea with loud noises. So those really, really loud rifle banging noises were causing this group of people to have deafness by the time they were in their 30s or 40s. And by the time they hit 50, they, they can hardly hear anything. Um, you know, someone who lives in a, in a city who goes and shoots rifles occasionally it's as if their their muscles are more adapted to being used to like pulling on that stapes from ramming into the cochlea. Um, so there was a doctor who went up to these Inuit uh, tribes and they were giving them earplugs. So when they go out and hunt, wear the earplugs and it's going to prevent that, that onset of deafness at a very young age. When we look really close at these auditory ossicles, these three middle ear bones, this one is the hammer. And if you use your imagination, you can picture that you know, like if you grab this part of it, here's the head of the hammer, like you could bang on something. This looks somewhat like an anvil, if you use your imagination. There it is. What, what a blacksmith would use or uh, what a cartoon character would use to injure another cartoon character. So the uh, incus or anvil is that middle bone of the middle ear bones. And then finally, um, here is, and actually this is a part of the incus, but here is the stapes or stirrup. It really does look like something you put your foot in. This is what is hitting uh, what's called the oval window of the cochlea, which you're going to see more about in a little bit. These three bones, amazingly, if you take them out of a person's body, you could fit them all on your thumbnail. Smallest bones in the human body. Pretty amazing. The inner ear, that, that deepest part of how the ear works, is made up of a bony labyrinth. Labyrinth like, like a cavernous kind of maze within here. And it's bony because it is hard all throughout. It's made up of three basic parts. The cochlea is that classic looking snail shell type part that has to do with your ability to hear. The vestibule, which is made up of a section called the utricle and the saccule, and the semicircular canals, these three loops, these all have to do with your equilibrium. Your, your brain gets uh, uh, information from these areas so that you know how your head is moving in space. Uh, and, and that's important to know. So we're going to start with the cochlea and then move on to these other sections. Imagine that we took that snail shell shaped cochlea and unraveled it. So it was curled up and then we unravel it. This is an image of what it would look like if it was unraveled. This part right here is known as the oval window. And this will be important in a little bit. Number four here, this is called the round window. And the way that I keep them straight is it's alphabetical if you go O down to R. So I think of oval window being on top of or superior to the round window because O comes before, before R. 
The organ of corti is kind of where all the action is going on inside the cochlea. And this is a zoom in of this organ of corti. When we look at the cochlea in terms of the, the fluid layers that are inside of this bony snail shell shaped part, there are three ducts. And there are a couple different ways to name them. So the vestibular duct is also called the scala vestibuli. So this and this are the same. The cochlear duct is also known as the scala media. It's in the middle. And in purple, we're going to label the tympanic duct, also called the scala tympani. Uh, this is called lymph. Uh, it's, it's a kind of fluid inside of uh, the cochlea. And depending on how the fluid shakes, it vibrates membranes inside of the scala media or cochlear duct, which contains the organ of corti. And we'll get to those membranes in a sec. But think of it this way. The stapes is just responding to what those other middle ear bones are doing. And then if we look back at the hammer, that's responding to how sound waves are vibrating against it. So as sound waves come in, depending on how the cochlea hits against, or sorry, how the stapes hits against the oval window of the cochlea, that's going to vibrate the fluid in such a way that's going to then vibrate um, the membranes and then change how these little neurons are, are either de being depolarized or repolarized. And that gives you your ability to hear amazingly. So when we look at the inside of the scala media, you've got the organ of corti. So here's the parts that are inside of the organ of corti. Uh, the basilar membrane, I'm going to use blue, is at the base of the organ of corti, below uh, these little accessory cells and before or sorry, below um, these little hair cells. Uh, another uh, term I've heard is stereocilia. Um, hair cells, it's not these, but it's little uh, neurons, modified neurons with cilia on the top of them. And the reason why I have my hand here is there is a membrane resting on top of them. If you look very carefully, here are the little cilia, those little, little black lines, and this orange section which I'm highlighting in red, is the tectorial membrane sitting on top of them. And in, and in orange here are those hair cells. These are the outer hair cells, and this one right here is an inner hair cell. And these are found all throughout the cochlea, from this region all the way to the edge here. Now the hair cells at this region, close to the stapes, are more sensitive to high frequency noises. The those kinds of noises. But at this end of the cochlea, that's sensitive to the world of oh, oh, oh. Those, those really, really low bass noises, which I, I can't even go as low as we can perceive. But the way that I remember what part is responds to which frequency is I think of a, a garden hose. If I take a garden hose and go like this with the garden hose, picture it's in my hand, I'm going like this. There'll be little waves in the beginning of the garden hose that you're not going to notice at the very, very end of it, like 40 feet further. And it's kind of like a high frequency noise. A high frequency noise is the sound waves are vibrating air molecules very quickly with respect to each other. So in the matter of a second, the cycles is very high. And we'll talk about that more in a sec. With low frequency noises, the frequency, there's not as much in terms of the number of vibrations that are happening in a second's time. So back to the garden hose example, a high frequency, or, or sorry, low frequency would be if I did the boom, if I went whoo with the hose, you would see kind of this arc go down the entire hose all the way to the edge. That's how a low frequency noise is going to stimulate this, this further edge uh, or the inside of the, the snail shell shape. Uh, so that's how I remember it, high frequency at this end, all the way down to low frequency. Another uh, application of this is as you age, you do not hear high frequency noises quite as well. And you young folk who have cell phones may be familiar with this. There's actually <laughs> a cell phone ringtone that is so high pitched that the average adult, including someone my age, uh, cannot hear anymore. So when you're born, you can hear up to 20,000 hertz. And I'm going to show you more of that on a, on a slide in, in the future. But as you age, as your stapes, the uh, stirrup, is hitting the cochlea, 
The hair cells that tend to get damaged first are the ones at this end of the scala media that are sensitive to the high frequency ones. The ones at the low end, you tend to keep those longer. So by the time you get to like 50, 60, 70, and so on, you've lost virtually all of these hair cells and you can't regenerate them. Once you lose the hair cells, they don't come back. Uh, maybe in the future, some kind of treatment will be able to regenerate them. But uh, my students uh, did a little test with me once where I found out that, that a student in my class had this ringtone. I said, all right, sometime in the next week, I want you to have that ringtone go off in class and we'll see if I can hear it. Because I was convinced at the time I was in my late 20s, I, I'm convinced I can hear it. And so one day I'm teaching and then all of a sudden they're all looking at me funny. I said, what, what's going on? What? I said, you don't hear that? No, I didn't hear it. And so by the time I was in my late 20s, I had already lost a bunch of the hair cells in terms of their functionality at this end. Um, I couldn't hear it 20,000 hertz anymore. Maybe I can only hear it 15,000 or 14,000. Um, but that's a little, little tale that relates the um, hair cells in the cochlea to the different frequencies. And there are nerve fibers uh, connected. You can see that here's a cochlear nerve connected to all these hair cells. And uh, these fibers down here run together and come into contact with the cochlear nerve. And it all comes into one nerve that connects all of these hair cells to each other. And that cochlear nerve goes to the temporal uh, lobe so that you can actually uh, perceive hearing. There's a separate nerve uh, called the vestibular nerve that has to do with the, uh, the vestibule and the semicircular canals. So this is related to what I was talking about in the previous slide, how sounds are heard. So this is step-by-step -step relating sound waves coming into uh, your ear canal all the way to the cochlea and how it communicates with the temporal lobe. So remember, um, low frequency noises, if you imagine that that image that a lot of computers have with raising the volume and, and putting the volume down. Low frequency is like this, and high frequency is like this. Just a lot more of these vibrations in that span of time. So the <laughs> is a high frequency, the <laughs> low frequency noise. So sound waves, um, depending on their frequency and depending on how loud they are, the uh, amplification of them, whatever sound waves they are, they're going to hit the eardrum in a certain pattern. So they hit the tympanum. Remember, the auditory ossicles are vibrated because they're attached to the tympanum. That amplifies the sound. The stapes connected to the oval window right here is going to vibrate against the fluids here. That, in turn, is going to vibrate the basilar membrane, which is right below um, the, the uh, hair cells, just posterior to them. And then those hair cells are moved because they're right next to the basal membrane. And depending on how they move, depending on how the cilia move, that opens up channels for sodium and potassium. And so you're going to depolarize, repolarize action potentials, just like in the previous lessons with neurons. And depending on which combination of hair cells are stimulated, that's going to give you the sensation of hearing all the different kinds of noises you hear, all the different pitches. And so the tectoral membrane moving with respect to those cilia is going to stimulate uh, certain neurons, certain hair cells, and then those cochlear nerve fibers take those signals into the temporal lobes. So when it comes to frequency and decibels, um, this is a little bit like what I mentioned before. Uh, every different sound wave has a wavelength. Um, some physicists don't like that term because wavelength is better when you talk about light, you know, waves looking like that in terms of the electromagnetic radiation, uh, you know, whether it's radio waves, microwaves, uh, the visual spectrum. So it's better to think of it in terms of this, like I mentioned before, which is like air molecules vibrating against each other. And then that's how sounds uh, get inside your ear. You may have heard that in space, you wouldn't be able to perceive sound because if you're out in space, there's no air molecules for sound to vibrate against. But here on Earth, we don't have to worry about that. So the number of cycles, the number of um, uh, how, how, the, how often the air molecules are bumping against each other per second is going to give you the different frequencies. And then on top of that, you've got decibel level, how loud the sound is or how faint the sound is. So you can have a high-pitched sound that is very loud, but you can also have a high-pitched sound that is not very loud. It's very... 
the right? You can have those different um, uh, decibel levels. Now, when it comes to frequency, we use Hertz. Hertz is the cycles per second named after a scientist by the name of Hertz. So 20 Hertz is at the lowest end of the frequency. Uh, and then 20,000 is the max that humans uh, can hear. Dogs can hear beyond that. That's why there's those dog whistles uh, that no human can perceive, but the dogs uh, can hear it. So 20,000 Hertz, a, a child or newborn can typically perceive that. But by the time you're in your adolescence and teenage years, you've already lost some of that. Uh, when you get into your 20s and 30s, you're losing more and more as you age because of what I told you before about the stapes hitting that part of the cochlea. When it comes to decibel levels in terms of loudness, it's a logarithmic scale. Uh, so when you look at 20 decibels versus 10, 20 decibels is 10 times louder than 10, but 30 decibels is 100 times louder than 10. That means 40 decibels is 1,000 times louder than a 10. So here are some examples. Zero would be the lowest audible level. The, the tiniest, tiniest, faintest noise. 40 <laughs> is, is just a quiet office. So that's a heck of a lot louder than a zero, but a quiet office where people aren't talking, you just hear those general noises, maybe an air conditioner, a water cooler, um, computer sounds. It's, it's a very peaceful atmosphere. A hundred times louder than that, is how I'm talking to you right now, a typical conversation. So I'm at about uh, decibel 60 right now. A lot louder than that is a chainsaw, right? If you're using a chainsaw without protection, uh, that's gonna be over time, something that could damage your hearing. 120, a loud rock concert, and a band like The Who uh, has set records in terms of loudness. Uh, that is going to be damaging your hearing over time. And Pete Townsend has said um, that he wishes he could go back and wear ear protection because he actually has uh, at least partial deafness from years of rocking out and having those amplifiers just blare noises uh, into his skull. 160 is going to make you deaf. Uh, if you were uh, there for a rocket launch right, right next to the rocket, or um, under a plane, a plane landing is gonna be probably more like 140, but still, without ear protection uh, from 120 to 160, you're risking uh, permanent damage and deafness. Now, I don't want you to think that um, you know 100 is not a problem or, or 90 is not a problem. If you listen to 100 decibel sounds over a long period of time, that could be just as bad as one or two seconds of 160. So it's all relative in terms of what the exposure is. But when you get up into this range, uh, not only are you gonna be having a lot of pain and maybe even ruptured eardrums, uh, you're risking permanent damage to your hearing. When we look at the vestibule, the part of the inner ear that has to do with equilibrium, there are two main sections. Um, there's the utricle and the saccule. So if you remember that image that had those semicircular canals, we're not talking about the canals right now. We're talking about that middle region between the canals and the cochlea. And remember, it, it is bony. Uh, so it's, you know, it's well protected and, and housed. But inside of the vestibule, this utricle and saccule each have something called a macula. And so the plural will be maculae. This is what a macula looks like. This is uh, the whole macula of either the utricle or the saccule. And what the vestibule in general does is if, if your head is still and you go up in, in an elevator, even if your eyes are closed, you know that you're going up or down. You just have a sense of it. And it's because of the vestibule. Based on how gravity pushes on the macula or if you have the opposite feeling of gravity that you're, you're rising up, that's, that's another um, action that's going to affect uh, the macula and allow you to perceive that. It's the same thing where if I'm sitting in a car and I'm not moving my head around, I could have my eyes closed and just know when the person is speeding up or slowing down. I just have that sense of it because that linear acceleration is pushing on part of the macula. And so that gravitational force or, or linear acceleration or, or deacceleration, or sorry, deceleration is the better term, is going to affect the autoliths. Autoliths basically means ear stones. There are these little tiny uh, hard uh, crystals almost that sit on top of this gelatinous layer, which is 
going to be uh, having these little hair cells embedded in it. So if I'm going up in an elevator, I'm going to have this sense that I, I'm actually, it's like the opposite of gravity. Um, or actually, it's going to feel like it's, I'm being pushed on. You know, even though I am rising up, I'm going to feel like I'm getting kind of pushed on. That's going to affect the autoliths. There's going to be um, action of those little tiny stones moving, and their movement is going to affect this gelatinous layer, which is going to manipulate these little cilia. And just like with the cochlea, that's going to cause depolarization, repolarization. That's going to activate uh, these nerve fibers. And it's the same where if I'm accelerating forward in a car, if let's say um, this is the uh, the front the front of your face is that way, if I'm accelerating forward, the autoliths are going to gradually kind of move this way, and that's going to drag on the the gelatin layer, and then that's going to affect the hair processes, the the, the cilia. Um, so if, if, if your body is on a roller coaster and your, and your head is, is still, your body is still, but you're being moved around, you definitely get a sense of that because of the actions that are happening within the vestibule. The semicircular canals, there's no coincidence here that there's three of them. It's perfect. There are three canals that correspond to the X, Y, and Z axes. So if you think about um, geometric graphs in, in three-dimensional space, X, Y, and Z, each of those canals correspond to the three planes. And that's great because depending on how your head moves in space, that's going to change what's going on in certain canals. One, sometimes all three. And so here are the planes. There's this one, there's this one, and there's this one. And depending on how you move your head, you're going to manipulate one or more of them. Uh, so each one of these semicircular canals, if you look at the canal being shaped like this, there is a uh, lymph fluid inside the canal. And then at the base of each of these three canals is something called an ampulla. And plural would be ampullae. Within one ampulla, there's a lot going on. The crista is pretty much this region. And that's made up of um, epithelium and then modified neurons with stereocilia, those cilia poking up in a gelatinous layer, very similar to the macula in the previous slide. So the crista is there, hair cells, that's the stereocilia, and then the cupula is this. And you can see how it's kind of surrounding the purple region, which is where the cilia are. So that gelatinous layer, uh, it, it is going to be manipulated based on how the fluid is moving in the semicircular canal. So the fluid sloshes based on how your head is moving. That moves the cupula. And then that's going to manipulate certain hair cells or modified neurons within this ampulla. And the endolymph is that fluid that is surrounding the cupula. The paralymph. Uh, is the rest of the fluid on the outside. So that's how your semicircular canals are going to function. When it comes to hearing conditions and disorders, um, one of the forms of uh, deafness is conductive deafness, which um, can be cured. Uh, it does, it's not necessarily permanent. That's usually something in the outer or external ear or middle ear that is preventing the transmission of sound waves to the cochlea. So somebody with conductive deafness could have a cochlea that's working perfectly fine, uh, but it might be a problem with the middle ear bones. It might be swelling. It might be a blockage in their uh, external auditory canal or ear canal. So conductive deafness uh, covers a range of, of re uh, reasons why you're not getting those sound waves coming all the way to the cochlea. Tinnitus is a ringing in the ears. I think we've all experienced it. Um, it, it could be a, a result of just overstimulation uh, of those hair cells. And sometimes, you know, you'll find yourself sitting in a quiet room and then it's like, it's just that, that ringing. It just doesn't go away. And then after several minutes, it, it does. Um, but there are cases where people have tinnitus that lasts uh, for months or years. Sometimes it could be um, 
a pressure problem. It could be swelling or blood pressure problems that are affecting the cochlea. So even though there's no sounds hitting the cochlea, remember the stapes is what's responsible for transmitting those sound waves to the cochlea, uh, it, it will give you the illusion that there is this sound. Otitis media is when there's something that has come into the middle ear uh, and caused a problem. Um, it, it could be uh, bacteria, it, it, some kind of infection. It even could be disgusting, uh, some kind of uh, microorganism like a, a very, very tiny uh, insect or um, maybe even a protist or something that has come up into your middle ear and, and caused um, swelling and inflammation. And that's something you don't want. Motion sickness is because what your eyes are telling your brain and what the semicircular canals and vestibule are telling your brain are not in sync. So an example is if you're reading in a car, and, and I can do that, no problem. Uh, other people can't. They'll be in a car reading, and then after just a little bit, they get nausea, get a headache. And that's because your eyes are telling you that you're not moving. You're just reading a book as if you were sitting in a chair at home. But your vestibule and maybe even your semicircular canals are telling your brain, uh, there's movement going on. And it's some kind of mixed set of information that has to do with the mesencephalon. That, that's what I've heard is the theory behind that. But we still don't know all the reasons why it results in nausea and vomiting. Um, so as time goes on, we're going to figure more and more about that. Uh, another source of motion sickness is going to be uh, for people who are on uh, a boat or a cruise ship. Um, you know, they'll be doing something inside the boat and their eyes are telling them that their body is, is still but the boat is moving and it's, it's definitely impacting those little hair cells inside of your vestibule or semicircular canals. And finally, uh, ear infections. Uh, ear infections, they happen um, if uh, bacteria, viruses, etc. Uh, get to the tympanic membrane. It can cause a lot of swelling, a lot of inflammation. It's going to be very painful. Uh, and ear infections can cause deafness if they're not treated. So if you have ear pain, Go see a doctor. Thanks for watching educator.com.